Here's Gene. <laughs> Friday Club is in session. Is in session. Come on, let's hear it again. Once more. <laughs> Very good. Once more, please. Once more. Oh, you know, that thing has about all the charm of uh, of a slow-motion dentist drill hitting a nerve. I'll tell you. Uh, you know, I have a friend who, uh, who collects antiques, but what he does is collect antique instruments of uh, medical torture. Which is not the same as, uh, you know, just collecting your average uh, fern holder from the 19th century. No, no. One of his major, uh, in fact, it's the jewel, the central jewel in the diadem of his collection. He has a treadle foot operated dentist drill. Now, you know, of course, at one time, the dentist, uh, you know, this is a historic, I never saw one except in this guy's collection, but uh, the dentist operated the drill with his foot, just like, a, you know, an old-fashioned uh, sewing machine, same kind of a treadle. He'd go, and he'd bring this thing down, see. Now, uh, the worst part of it was that the faster the guy's foot was, the less the pain, obviously. The slower his foot was, Oh, 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 you God. Oh, please. Once more in thy flight. Once more, I say. That's right. <laughs> and uh, what he does, you see, he, uh, he, uh, he puts friends of his. He's got this ancient dentist chair. And uh, he, he plays the whole role. Oh, yes. Uh, today, you understand that the, uh, the antique world is no longer what it once was. Uh, antiques are not just allowed to sit in the corner that the antiques are functional now. So uh, many is the lady now grinds her coffee every morning with an 1830 coffee grinder. She's very proud of it. Of course, uh, every night, though, the old man has to take the iron filings out of his teeth after he's drunk the coffee, but that doesn't matter. It's, a, it's a, you know, a return to the past. It's, a, it's nostalgiaville. There are guys today who are driving to work in uh, 1958 Edsel's proudly in spite of the uh, unbelievable oil bills. You know, the Edsel, uh, after it's gone for maybe uh, two or 300 miles above its 2,000-mile uh, warranty period, uh, tended to just pump oil right out in its raw state, right out of the exhaust. It didn't even burn it. It just pumped it out on the road. So, uh, this, is <laughs> so this is all part of it. And, and, and he is, he's part of this trend, see. He, he, uh, he loves his dentist drill. And... Uh, one of the deepest uh, held secrets in his life is the fact that when he was going to college, when he was in his undergraduate days, 
he was in pre-dent and he didn't cut it. Oh no, it's very easy to flunk pre-dent because they take things like uh, organic chemistry which has been the stumbling block to many a person's uh, education including guess who? I mean I've always had a deep suspicion of anybody who actually likes chemistry and uh, he, uh, he personally uh, he just failed out you know but he never stopped in his mind being a dentist he is let us put it this way a latent orthodontist that's the worst kind of latency he's gonna come out of the closet one day and start straightening teeth he's tried it a couple of times the instant method in bars unfortunately it's happened to him uh, you know, and his teeth. <laughs> but to, to be a latent dentist is not one of uh, is not one of those things that the average man has. And so, when he saw this dentist drill uh, in a Salvation Army junk heap in Orono, Maine, it was just down there amid a lot of old uh, used oil drums and barrels and 1928 uh, Atwater kits and junk like that. He saw that dentist drill. And he says, it is it's one thing I can't pass. And he bought it. He restored it to its full evilness. And uh, now he's even got the drills for it. Incidentally, early 19th century foot-operated drills, the drills themselves, would make your average uh, drill set that the guy picks up at the Western Auto Store look like surgical equipment. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> But he's got them, see? And he loves to put his friends, and they put, he puts this white thing around them. And then he goes, and he, he, he's got one of these old lamps. It's a, it's a light that sits up right over your head, you know. He says, look up into the light now. This will not hurt. And that's right. Everybody has a good laugh, and then they go back to drinking vodka martinis again. And uh, but one day, one day, I know what's going to happen to Stanley. He's going to strap somebody in that chair when there are four sheets to the wind, and he's going to actually do it, foot and all. And uh, so that's the way it's going. Madness is rampant in our land. And uh, may I have a little uh, squawk in there to salute madness, please? <laughs> Very good. I love it. But uh, madness, of course, takes many shapes and forms. You know, back in the in the uh, in the late 19th century, actually the middle 19th century, Vienna had a waltzing madness, where they waltzed night and day. Uh, guys would waltz in their sleep, and uh, the Strauss brothers were turning out waltzes, uh, you know, quicker than the Rolling Stones turn out records, and waltzes were coming out of everything. That was a madness. It's absolute madness swept Vienna. And there have been other madnesses sweep various nations. At one time there was a yo-yo madness in our country when uh, the yo-yo champions stood in every Woolworth store with a t-shirt that says Filipino yo-yo champ, national invitational, and uh, they'd, they'd play with the yo-yos day after day. They're gone. Not forgotten, but gone. The current madness I have to go on record as a as an artist is the chicken band. CB. You don't know what's chicken band? That's called the chicken band among people who know something about electronics. Chicken band or the children's band. And uh, <laughs> CB. The CB madness has swept America. And I have just returned from a 2,000-mile trip in the hinterland. And uh, for miles around, on every on every landscape, can be seen uh, automobiles moving over the roads with people clinging to a cheap microphone, jabbering endlessly to people they would never talk to if uh, it wasn't on CB. Endlessly yammering away. It's the insensate desire to be in touch with another human being. Now that's a fad. Now a lot of people don't recognize it. I'm coming on record as saying Three years from now, people will discover their old CB set down in the basement or in the garage. They're going to wonder, what the hell? Did, what was all that about? <laughs> what was all that about? In fact, the wildest manifestation of uh, CB madness, I came across it in Iowa. Yeah, I was driving along, I think it was US 80 in Iowa. Uh, Iowa is a great, fantastic 
27 lane super super highway and on all sides the Iowa countryside just stretched endlessly to the horizon rolling hills and lush green farms and there was a long line of traffic of which I was you know just turnpike type traffic all moving along see enigmatically and uh I got the CB on because I'm, I'm monitoring the madness of our time. I, I love it, you know. I don't love CB, but I love madness. So let's get our terms straight, gang. Uh, in fact, uh, I can't stand yo-yos, but I love to watch yo-yo people. I can't stand rock, but I love to watch the great endless numbers of the dedicated gather with their vacant expressions and their T-shirts and their $40 tickets clutched in their sweaty hands. Madness of our time. And by the way, almost all madnesses involve mass movements. Private madness is eccentricity. My friend who works his treadle-operated dentist drill is eccentric. But if everybody in the country bought one, that would be mass madness. It's like the Moonies. That great maniacal horde of, uh, of uh, mesmerized automatons marching with that crazy, uh, maniacal, curious, automaton smile. Madness. And years from now, people will record this madness and write about it. But those who are involved in it never see it as that. Some idiot spending 42 hours a day waltzing madly in Vienna did not know he was involved in mass madness. He was just doing the thing. He was doing what he had to do. He could not escape it. Zeitgeist. We are part of the great vast atmosphere that is around us. I mean, you can't escape it. You simply can't. And I'm driving along 80, see, and I'm listening to all these guys yammering, going back and forth, using the cliches, you know, the, it's an endless stream of cliches come out of CB. And all the voices on CB sound either like Johnny Cash with a clothespin on his nose, and there's a lot of women on it, and they all sound a little like Minnie Pearl. Uh, you don't know who Minnie Pearl is? Well, that's your homework for tonight. And so, no matter what part of the country you go, they all assume this CB dialect. You drive through the Bronx, and they don't talk like Bronxites. They're saying things like, hey, 10-4, boy. It's all suddenly, <laughs> it's like it's a, it's like really it's instant South Dakota. And they're all, they're all coming out with this talk. See, that's part of the madness. You have to be part, you have to be alike. That's the important thing of madness. You have to wear the suit. You can't imagine uh, in a great crowd of Moonies marching along Broadway, one guy is wearing a button-down Brooks Brothers suit. No way. He would be rejecting his madness. And if you're mad, you do not reject it. In fact, you enter it with great gusto and cries of goatish joy. And so uh, <laughs> I'm driving along 80s and I'm listening to this constant insane yammering going back and forth saying, and uh, you hear little moments of drama like one guy has uh, decided that he would like to make the scene with one of the lady sea beers who's driving along and then it turns out that directly behind her is uh, this 18-wheeler carrying flatbed steel from Pittsburgh. Happens to be her husband driving along behind her. And there <laughs> and there was a little moment there, a flurry of yelling back and forth, and it disappeared like a, hey, would you like to try that in the next rest stop? Huh? Huh? Ten four, buddy. Let's hear from that, huh? And then there's a pause. Ah! And he drops out. No more talk from the uh, from the, uh, the hornet that was making all the talk. And uh, in the middle of all this, I hear this guy comes out and he says, this is the preaching padre. Preaching Padre, yeah, that's handled here, buddy. Ten four, you copy? I said, Preaching Padre, could it be? And sure enough, halfway through the conversation, I discovered that I was in the middle of a traveling CB congregation. Yes. He's, every, it was a Sunday morning, and he was out gathering the flock out on US 80, on CB. And he began his sermon. And now I want to say that God, God in all his wisdom has given us CB. All us little citizens now got a voice. And God has given us the CB coming down from heaven with all them transistors. He has given us 23 channels of truth. And I say here on channel 19, 
I say on channel 19 that he who seeth the vision, he who seeth the truth, he who has accepted the Lord with absolute humility and has come to the Lord and says, Lord, I'm just a small, tiny person in this great, vast channel of existence. I say to you, I say that you shall be saved. And I'm listening to this. Says, yeah, I'm telling you the truth. I'm hearing his sermon. It suddenly hit me. This is probably the first sermon in the world. Traveling along at 87 miles an hour, keeping an eye. By the way, right in the middle of the sermon, he says, And I say to you up there front, who's got the front door? You keep your eye out for Smokies. And I say to you, who's got the back door and all your righteousness, watch out over your shoulder for Smokies. I'm right here in the rocking chair. And I'm saying to you, I'm saying to you, I've got life and truth and liberty. And I say, oh my God! Well, I suspect the day is going to come when the first C.B. Sturman, the first carrying of the truth to the multitude, is going to be interrupted by a giant head-on on USA. And the devil has come on the scene in the form of a Pontiac Starfire. Who lost the Battle of Princeton? There was a Battle of Princeton, you know. You need to tell me you don't know that much about our history. I mean, Americans are the dumbest people in the world. I'll tell you, they really are. <laughs> Why, do you realize that there there is a hall at Princeton that uh, Washington himself spent some time in? I mean, the university I'm talking about. And that university was in full swing at the time of the Revolutionary War. And that's in direct contrast to the Indianapolis School of Chiropractic Medicine which was founded in 1976, late in the uh, month of March, and by the way, is already in trouble. But uh, nevertheless, uh, Princeton uh, was in full swing. Now, who lost the Battle of Princeton, and who was involved? Who were the two generals? Most, who was it? When was it? It was in the Revolution. And uh, who... who uh, <laughs> Actually, that wasn't a true revolution, you know. You know, really, I hate to bring this this bad point. Shepard's a stickler for words. A revolution is when you overthrow your own government. Now, uh, uh, when when we did we did not go and and kick the king off the throne. We merely split away from England, which would make it more an insurrection, not a revolution. Sorry, friends. A revolution is when, for example, seven guys sitting around down in a joint someplace down in, uh, you know, in the off street somewhere in a tavern say, we've got to get rid of the king, or uh, let's get rid of that Batista, of which, see, this is a government of their own, at which point you go charging in there, you blow the whole place up, you take over. That's called a revolution. However, uh, it wasn't our government we threw over, it was the, uh, the English control of our country that we threw up, not the same. Bum, ba -dum, bum. We did not go and unseat Parliament. So it was not a revolution in the strictest sense of the word. It's a nice, uh, it's a nice uh, romantic word to use, but it doesn't really fit what happened then. Uh, so uh, we haven't ever had a real revolution in this country. Now a revolution would be, let's say, if the, uh, if, uh, the United uh, Good People's Party and it suddenly laid siege to Washington, entered the White House, kicked President Ford out, and announced over, uh, over the radio, We are now in charge! Do not leave your house! You will be sent your instructions! That's a revolution. But that didn't happen here. And so, uh, you know, I don't like to be a sore head about words. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll ask you another question. You heard of, uh, say, Clinton, New Jersey... You have heard of this town? Who is that named after? Right. So I'm not going to bother you with that one. Uh, it is interesting to know, though, that he was among the enemy forces. <laughs> that throws you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, now you talk. You know, you want to you know, talk about the bicentennial characters. Nobody mentions much about uh, Benedict Arnold. Uh, how many of you know why Benedict Arnold sold out? Was it because 
he uh, saw that the revolution was a bad scene. He, no, he sold out according to all the records that are available because he was bugged because he didn't get promoted. That's really, see, man's greed for fame and fortune. And uh, the British promised him a, a direct commission as a general in the British Army. Well, that's pretty heavy stuff. And uh, he, he, he was pretty bugged. What was his rank, incidentally, when he did this? Captain, are you kidding? Benedict Arnold, a captain? He, what, was his, what was his job when he did it? What do you mean, just West Point? Was he a cadet? Well, a, a, a captain is never the commandant of West Point, friend. That shows how little you know. It's like, corporal, huh? No, no, he was the head of West Point, and he was very angry because he felt this was not an important post. They were not using him. And he was really bugged about that. And uh, he felt, even though at the time he had achieved what you would consider high rank, he felt that others had moved beyond him. And uh, so he was ready to sell out, and he did. Who was the guy he sold out to? Why do I know these things? Did I learn? No, I did not look it up. Do I learn? I, well, I must say that in spite of all my laughing about the Warren G. Harding School, it must have been one hell of a school. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. In fact, we had a pageant. I was part of a pageant in which now you're gonna, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna say, well, that's cheating. But I was part of a pageant when I played personally. I played the guy who Benedict Arnold sold out to. Is that why I know? No, everybody in that class knew it too. Because after it was all over, I'll never forget the reviews that came out in the Warren G. Harding Teapot uh, Tattler which was the name of our paper, the Warren G. Harding Teapot Tattler. And uh, why do we call it that? <laughs> I'm surrounded by ignorance. Don't you get it? The Warren G. Harding Teapot Tattler. Oh, yes. You see why my comedy never works? Because you have to, I have to explain all the gags to people, you know. You know. That's why you all understand soupy sales and have trouble with me. <laughs> oh, this is a Chevy Chase world. And if you have more words than six in your vocabulary, you're dead. Chevy Chase, whose biggest thing is falling over backwards. It's about all he does. And incidentally, you know who does that better? The whole Chevy Chase act is done better on Hee Haw. Yes. Watch Hee Haw once. Force yourself once. And you will see a guy do a far better and funnier newscast than Chevy Chase. And he's an old friend of mine called Donald Heron. He's from Canada. Good actor. But that's neither here nor there, friends. I'm, you know, I'm... <laughs> uh, it is always an old axiom. He who cometh second make it all the way. He who pioneers is forgotten. Right. So, uh, in other words, uh, don't be the first on your block to come up with a great gag. Because instantly the Milton Berle in your neighborhood will steal it and wind up on Saturday Night Live, <laughs> becoming famous, <laughs> and you're dead, D-E-D. -E -D. However, uh, that's neither here nor there. I'll never forget, though, walking out on the stage of the Warren G. Harding Auditorium, dressed in my wig, and by the way, in full, in full regimental tick. Yes, when I was playing the guy that... Uh, that uh, Benedict Arnold, and Benedict Arnold, incidentally, was played by Jack Morton. Well, the reason Jack Morton played Benedict Arnold in our school was because uh, he was a tall guy. He was about six foot seven already in third grade. And he had the chiseled profile that uh, is so admired by historical drama people. And uh, yes, Jack Morton. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Jack Morton was a fantastic Benedict Arnold because he had a lot of it in his soul. Uh, I mean, you have to have a... To play Iago just absolutely right, I, uh, the greatest Iago in the world would be a William Morris agent. He could play that right down to the last final yell. You know, as poor old, old Botello goes and grabs that dagger and sticks it into Desdemona. And uh, he's seen this many times in the, the William Morris agency, so he'd love it. However, uh, I, uh, I coming on the stage was one of the great moments of my uh, theatrical career. Coming out on the stage, 
And it's what convinced me that I had to be in show business. Uh, you know, this, to me, this is uh, the only life for me. I came out on the stage, and the entire assembled student body of the Warren G. Harding School, and it was a big school, the entire student body as one hissed. As I outlined my plan to Benedict in what I thought was an English accent. But it didn't matter. It was the spirit of the role that carried me forward. And I, I said, I come bearing, bearing an offer from the central headquarters. And I will not give you Benedict Arnold's rank, because that was part of it. I am bearing you an offer. We will afford you asylum in the native, in our homeland. We will also offer you a permanent rank of brigadier general in the British Army. Permanent rank, not temporary, permanent. And there will be certain monies that will be made available to you. You will be honored in, in the homeland. And, and he, he looked at me and he says, What? You are asking me to sell out my command at West Point? Not sell out. Just prove your, your faith in the king. We do not ask a man to sell out his soul. We ask a man merely to be loyal. He says, Ah, that's precisely the way I think of it. And uh, nevertheless, we consummated the deal, and the great scene came at the end when I was, what happened to that man who dealt with Benedict Arnold? That's your homework for next week. No, no, no. Beheading was not done in, in the colonies. No. What happened to him? And he has gone down in legend. And there are songs about him. His rank, by the way, was much lower than uh, Benedict Arnold's rank. He was merely bearing, he was the message bearer. Uh, he was, uh, and, and then he traveled, yes, he traveled throughout the, uh, the colonies then, trying to escape, dressed as a simple farmer. But that didn't work. Uh, since, uh, obviously, he was a member of one of the elite regiments of uh, the British Army. And what regiment was it? That is correct. But what regiment was he a member of? Aha! That makes the big difference. Because there are regiments in England, and then there are regiments. <laughs> one either has the old school tie, or one doesn't. And, uh, and the good major did have the tie. And so Benedict Arnold and I, and, and from, from that time on, you know, it was very funny. From the time that I played this role, I, I, uh, I, I, it affected me for the rest of the days at Warren G. Harding School. People always looked upon me as vaguely a little sneaky and possibly un-American. And that persists to this day. Any man who thinks that a CB preacher is the ultimate in madness obviously is un-American. Please that ends our bicentennial seven hours for tonight. That's the way it was for a brief time in our country's early days. Brought to you by Shell. Oh, by the way, one more question. Who turned in uh, Benedict to Arnold? Oh, we're getting very... And to whom did this person turn Benedict Arnold in? What was Aaron Burr's rank? When Burr was fighting up in Canada. Captain, you keep saying captain over and over again. You keep saying that long enough, you'll find one that was. That was a curious army. You were either a private or a general. And, uh, there were a few colonels. They usually sold out, like Burr. Well, it ain't the way Gore Vidal had it, is it? What makes us think that Gore Vidal is the final expert on history? 
any more than thinking Jacqueline Su- uh, Suzanne was the final expert on Hollywood. Trust not, oh, thy fork at pen. That's on, 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 that's on,